get into tonight because some of the answers to this, these questions are the people who are actually come to speak to you tonight. Name and the idea of all this is to give you an idea of what's happened in the past that people have achieved quite substantial what? things in orienteering and based on the hands that went up last night when I said who knows what Grant, who Grant Blewett is and what he's achieved in orienteering, uh, there weren't too many hands go up, but we have Grant here in the audience tonight. <laughs> so we're going to fix that up because I want you to know what these people have done. So this is a lead in to it. The name of the men who came sixth in the walk relay, which is Australia's best result in a walk relay for the men, um, in 2001 in Finland were? Grant Willard. In running order, or in a half. Just names and do quick. Oh, Rob, 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 Rob. Rob Walter, Tom Quayle, Grant Blewett, and Roy yeah. de Haas. Which woman made up, which women, sorry, made up the relay team at WOC in 2006 that came fourth? Australia's best performance in a WOC relay for the women. It was a three person relay. One of them, and one of them is Joe, the other one was Hanny Alston, and the third one was Grace Nelson, who's now Grace Crane. Who won the World Games, the World Games in Japan in 2001? In the room. Grant Blewett. Against the best in the world. They're held every four years. Which Australian woman represented Australia at WOC for six consecutive years from 2003 to 2008? Joe Allison. Quite an achievement. Six consecutive years. Which Australian man came fourth in Jaywalk Long in 2005? Julian. Which Australian won a gold Jaywalk, a, sorry, a Jaywalk gold and a Walk gold in the same year? He had to name the year, the person, and the event. It's Hanny Alston, Jaywalk Long, and Walk gold. Spring. Which athletes represented Australia at Walk in 1985 in Bendigo? Um, we have the daughters of one of those people in the audience tonight. Did you know? No. Oh, shocker. The men, in order of finishing the long, because they only had a long and a relay, and the relay was four people, the fit order of finish was Rob Vincent, Terry Farrell, Rob Plowright, Morris Ongania, and Michael Downing. The father of Anna and Zoe. And the women's team was Madeline Savar, Sue Key, um, her children still are into you, Carolyn Jackson, Adrian and uh, Tim's mother, and Jenny Bourne, the mother of Dean and Linda Lawford, and Christine Marshall, the mother of Nicola Marshall, who still are in tears. So there you go. That was 1985, a year after I started Orange Um uh, Which Australian athlete came third in Jaywalk Long? In 1999 in Bulgaria. Troy. Troy de Haas. Troy Haas. Which Australian athlete was a, in a winning Eukola team? Eukola is the uh, seven man relay held in Finland every year with over 1,500 teams in it. So quite an achievement to be in the winning team. Who was the Australian? Grand Long Knight. Troy de Haas. Long Knight. Troy de Haas. Which Australian athlete was in second place in the Tia Miller, which is the 10 person relay in Sweden and has a similar number of teams and was the fastest on the second leg? Julian Den. Julian Den. Julian Den. And which Australian athlete <laughs> came eighth in the WOC sprint in 2003 in Switzerland? And I should say that he also won the qualification sprint the previous day or same day, I don't know. But he came eighth in the final at WOC in the sprint. And that was Grand Floyd. Which is the lead-in to the first speaker, Grant. He's going to talk first. Um, my, my brief to them was to talk about their career development, orienteering from 16 to 25. The purpose of it is to give you an idea of the sorts of things they went through in their development to achieve the, the level they did. <coughs> that it emphasises that there's no one set pathway from the age of 16 to 25 and beyond to reach the top level. They've all reached the top level, but they've done it in slightly different ways. So you're about to hear that experience. Thank you very much, Grant. Hello, 
everyone. I wasn't expecting to be filmed, and I was expecting a lectern or something, so I like to fiddle. And... So I don't know how I'm going to stand. It's going to be awkward. Anyway, um, so 16 to 25. 60, that means 1988 to 1998 for me. So Aston, I know, wasn't born then, so some of you won't be born in 1998. So it's a long time ago. So I don't, uh, I don't blame it. No one knows who I am. That's that's cool. Um, so 1988, um, Easter, and I won Easter. So it's sort of. I suppose I have to tell you what happened before then. I started running through 19. First Easter was 1986, and before that I was into sport, you know, I loved running, swimming, did a lot of swimming and running and um, other stuff. But, um, so, I got into Orange during 85, 86, went to my first Easter, and I was pretty sure I was going to win Easter, 1986, my first one. I came second last. <laughs> and the guy I beat, I'm pretty sure, had a learning disability. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bit better after that, um, but 1998, I won Easter, and that was a big shock to me. So I, that was sort of, um, I suppose, that kicked things off a little bit. Um, so all through high school, I, I was into orienteering, I was really into running, water polo, and swimming as well, basically, and uh, triathlons. And um, I remember in year 12. One of my best mates at the time, Jack McRae, now you all know who he is either. <laughs> I went to jail with him and that. <laughs> Some of them, I think the old ones. And um, he, he was, we were the same year in orienteering, but he was a year ahead of me in school. He was born at the start of the year, I was born at the end of the year. And he, so I was in year 12 and he left school and we were talking about stuff and he's going, oh, it's really weird when you, you know, all of a sudden you've left school and orienteering is the most important thing in your life. <laughs> what? Oh, you think the most important thing in life? I was, no way. Um, but then, 12 months later, I pretty soon found that I ain't found the most important thing in my life. But I had nothing else, I wasn't good at anything else. <laughs> well, so, I ain't doing anything a bit. Well, there's not, I was, so in year 12, I was pretty competitive as a runner. I was sort of like fourth in the state, in cross country, and I think second in the 1500. So the times I ran when I was in year 12, uh, about nine minutes for 3K, around about. And, um, and I was really like five ones as well, but it was expensive. And so um, I went to my first jaywalk the year after I left school. And at that stage, before I went to jaywalk, I was saying that triathlon running and orienteering, I sort of all liked equally. But then I had my first experience of overseas orienteering and I was hooked like that. I, it was a big sport and I didn't, didn't really realise that. So from that day, from when I went over and then my first day, what I suppose, then orienteering was the most important thing in my life for the next 10 or so years. So it's a bit sad that it was. Um, I trained a lot. Is it, I mean, I trained... Yeah, I trained as a junior. It was just that was one thing I did. I trained for swimming, I trained for running, and not a hell of a lot. But I, in today's standards, I probably train a reasonable amount. I was in an athletes club, so I do intervals twice a week and things like that. Um, I go and run in the club athletics on the weekends, and I wouldn't do as a junior. I didn't do any long runs and that. I ran, if I ran, I ran as hard as I could. I ran fast, and that was it. And then. Um, I left school and I went over there to jaywalk. My first jaywalk, I was 40 something in the long and but the, I didn't make the final in the middle. And then the relay, I ran first leg and um, I got distance at the start and then I found myself in the lead for the second half of the race. And then um, people started catching me. So I got to the last control. This is before one handed, before. Um, SI and EBIT and that sort of stuff. I remember I was so nervous and I was I was a pretty fast puncher. I was I spent a lot of, lot of time learning the one-handed punch and I was uh, told last night that one-handed that was a 
wasted skill. I spent hours and hours on it, an obsolete skill. But I was a pretty fast puncher. Then I went in for the last control with like three three others. There's four going for the last control, and I couldn't one-handed punch. Two-handed punch. I was, I was, we were all in the same second, so that, I was pretty pretty proud about that. So it sort of made me realise I can I can uh, mix it to the best as well. And then I went to O-ring and I ran A short, not like people these days run leads and A long and that, and I thought that's probably a good, a good thing. But that was a dumb thing back then. I ran A short and I won, and I thought I was king of the world. And, <laughs> 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 then uh, the next year I went to J-Walk. So that was my last year of juniors. So back then, that was sort of the start of people sending teams to J-Walk. So no one went to J-Walk when I was going to school back then. Um, so that was my last year in Finland, and I was there for four months to stay with a bloke in Sweden. You know, I just met sometime, and you know, I've not stayed here for four months. It worked out, it was all right. And um, I trained heaps. I trained a lot over there, and uh, I trained a lot of orienteering, and a lot of orienteering intervals, and um, still only once a day, I'd say, but I ran, you know, probably 90 minutes a day, and I ran pretty hard most of it, so I was, and a lot of orienteering. And I, I think when I went into that, my last day walk, it was in Finland, and I, I felt like I could run as fast as anyone there, but I wasn't as good as anyone there. So I, I came in the top 19th and 16th, I think, in the two races, and I remember in the long, I came 16th, I was just bitter, I was so, so bitter, I just, I thought I could have easily been in the top three, I could have easily been. In hindsight, this, there was nothing to say I was going to be in the top three in that race. So I never, I always made a five minute mistake. So I was always, every race I made a five minute mistake, so I was going to make a five minute mistake in that race too. So. Unless I followed someone or something. Like that. So I was 19th and 16th, and then I was a senior. So first year seniors, I made what? Um, that was in uh, USA, Anti Fever was in the team. I didn't make the final in the middle and I ran last leg in the relay and do we tenth was tenth I think. Yeah sure. Well, I went out <laughs> I think Warren was in the team too and um, I think it was tenth. So you know. And I suppose my first years of juniors that in looking back, I first years of seniors, I just sort of floated along a bit. I wasn't I sort of thought I was training hard, but I didn't really. I was just, you know, training once a day and no real structure to what I did. Then I got a girlfriend and that was important and those <laughs> sorts of things. And just she wasn't really an orienteer, she was only to a bit and so 93, 94, 95, you know, I was still competitive but I wasn't I didn't really give it my all. And in hindsight, yeah, just when you're young, you just have to do it. Just go for it. Like just no you, you change very fast from being young and talented to, uh, to being a has-been. Like it, it just goes like that. So there's not, don't wait for anything. Just go for it. I wish I did that. But, so I broke up with that girlfriend. Or she broke up with me, more to the point. And uh, then I had a lot of time on my, train, on my hands to train. Then I started training properly, I'd say, in 1996. So I trained, you know, I was training twice a day. And, um, Trained pretty hard. So I also trained a lot of track as a junior. So I did athletics, but probably from when I reached the season, I didn't train much track at all. I had I have real issues if I run on the track. I have, I have to run on the track two or three times a week to be able to keep running on the track. So if I just run once every two weeks on the track, once at, once even once a week on the track, I <coughs> really bad really sore calves afterwards. So I sort of avoided running track. I didn't do many races, um, track races, but I did like mountain races and stuff like that. Um, so 96, I started training hard. Um, I went overseas again for four months, that was the plan. And um, 1996 is when the Park World Tour started, and that was um, the birth of spring orienteering. It was um, 
I think it was 20 or 30, 20, 20 or 25, I can't remember, it changed between 20 people to 30 people to start here throughout this time, but um, it was invite only and there was prize money and it was televised and all that sort of stuff. So the first race was in Barca in Finland and I heard about it back in Australia, you know, I didn't, you know we didn't have internet and that sort of stuff, but you know, I can't remember, I heard about it somehow. This is how, this is how much I was into orienteering, by the way. Um, when I was last year junior, I, um, that was after I spent that four months overseas. You couldn't get the results of Swedish races, obviously there's no internet and stuff like that. But I knew that the library in the middle of Sydney had the Swedish newspaper and it was about five days late. So five days after every week, so about Thursday, Friday every, every week, I'd go into Sydney and go to the library and look through Dargan's Nieta and try and find the results for races. So I was pretty passionate about it. I was really nerd. Um, but probably could have trained harder. Um, <laughs> spend more time training and less time travelling the city to look at results. Um, yeah, so I got a race in the second... When I went over there, I got a race in that um, second park or two race. And that sort of changed everything for me. I got to run this sprint race and I was second. And Yuri Olomachenko, none of you know these people, but Yuri Olomachenko won. He was the world champion in the business at the time. And um, Jürgen Mortensen was third. He was the world champion long distance at the time. And little old me was second, I thought. I was, I'm still pretty, um, pretty proud of that. I, thought, uh, I did, um, and it changed everything. So following that, I had sort of, you know, people sort of were there to help me out. You know, they realised I probably had some potential and that sort of stuff. So I stayed longer. Um, Jürgen Mortensen organised a dodgy job for me in Norway, an uh, orienteering camp. So I just, for two months, I put out, I tagged control sites for the, there's going to be an orienteering camp there the next summer. So I just went out and tagged orienteering sites for two months. Apparently they lost all the maps. <laughs> had to redo them anyway. <laughs> it was all right. And then, um, 1997, well, I came back and worked in Warren's bike shop. I was a bum. I lived with Warren and Tad. <laughs> Did some dodgy stuff. And, um, <laughs> and then, um, I was desperate to get to Europe. And there's no, like, working bees or anything like that. Like, and there's no, I wasn't smart or anything, so I couldn't go over and study and stuff like that. So um, I got offered Jürgen Mortens, who was the god, he was a tier in Georgia over now. He offered me to come over and be his nanny. So I went over and lived with Jürgen, Jürg I was his nanny for a year, and was trained and looked after kids, and um, that was sort of... 97, I didn't... I don't think uh, my results were great, but I was still in the spin orienteering, I was reasonable, I often was in like the top 10 in the spin orienteering races in the park or tour. It was a little chance. In Norway, yeah, so I, yeah, like I trained really well for Norway actually, and um, but I, I didn't do it. Um, I managed to stay over there just bumming around 1998 as well, and 1998 I sort of started to get quite competitive in most races sort of on the local scene over there and um, you know I'd win elite races and stuff like that in all distances every now and again and like that was sort of when I first went over there I thought I, I was competitive in sprints and sometimes in the first leg of a relay but then I actually became quite competitive. Um, so that's 1998 and um, that, that year I ran my um, first track race for since I was probably, no, I did run a couple of 5Ks back in Australia in the year before, but not very regularly, but I ran my first track race, that was off, off no running or no track running, but I did a lot of training, so um, I ran 14.37, I think, and that was probably the last time I ran a track race in, while I was training hard, just because I could not, I could hardly walk for a week after it. It was, um, it was in, I went out thinking I wanted to play 15, so I ran the first K in three minutes. And it was wet, and I lapped everyone in the field, and I remember there was a tape down the, tape down the back straight. And um, 
the wind was blowing that tape out in delay once they had the rain in lane two and stuff like that. So I, I think it was, I, I was a fast, probably was a bit faster runner than that at the time. But that was sort of when I was at my, from 1998 to sort of 2001, 2002 was when I was at my physical peak. Um, and then I felt like I could run, I felt like on my day I could mix it with basically anyone for up to an hour. For 90 minute races, I probably could mix it with the tough guys. Um, I remember after that track race, I spent a week with the Swiss chances a week after I couldn't run and I was just sitting around and then had another week we went to the World Cups. The World Cups were big back then because we had world champs every second year and in, in the off year was the World Cups. So I went down to Poland for the World Cups with Shep and um, Tom. We went down, we didn't have any visas and we got sort of locked up at the border. And um, then we said, oh, we'll get a transit visa for two days to get us through and we bought this transit visa. We stayed for like a week and a half. <laughs> and, um, and I ran the relay there, and I remember that was one of the pretty cool feeling of running first leg there. Everyone just ran away from me with the first control. Like, always. Like, orientees are shocking at pacing themselves. So that, I think that was one of my strengths in sprint orienteering, is that I had a track running background, so I knew the pace that I could sustain for 15 minutes, or, and I know the pace I can sustain for an hour, or I don't really know what I did then. And um, so every relay, every mass start, every just runs like an idiot, and they get lapped here, and then you just pick them off the race. And it, it was it's still a case, I mean, it was still a case in the senior, senior ranks back then. So it was typical, everyone ran ahead of me, and I was last to start trying to go and one of the first to first control. And I remember there's a pack of three of us towards the end, and I just scattered this slide. And I just sort of ran away from everyone. I came in, you know, the 30 second lead and stuff like that. I can do this. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, I suppose that brings me to 1998. But I suppose the period from 96 to 2004, 2005 really, I trained. I train twice a day, most days a week, probably 12, 12 sessions a week, I'd say, on average. And I did um, all through the off season, I probably did one interval session a week. And in racing season, I probably did one race and one interval session a week, or two races and one interval session a week. I never did a hell of a lot of interval sessions. But that wasn't really, it wasn't my weakness. That running, that fast running, I thought I had to, that, that was a decision for me. I had to build that base and that strength in the terrain. But really, you have to, you have to do quite a lot of interval training at some stage in your, in your career, I think, to just get, get the pace. The other. And I can't recommend enough joining an athletes program. Like going out and doing interval training by yourself. Pretty hard, and you'll know, you won't you won't know how to push yourself to the you won't be able to push yourself to the level that you can when you're running with a group. Sure, you can do it if you're based overseas. You can do it with a group of volunteers, but in Australia you can't do that. Like, even if there are a group of volunteers here, but train only. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna be very lucky to have three. Or, you have to have three or four. You can be competitive, and those sessions are like. You should hardly be able to walk, to walk home, like, you know, just laying in bed at night. It's just that awesome ache for your body. And, you know, so. Training hard is it's fun. And um, I think I've built, I, I was able to train for a long, you know, two hours a day for a long time without getting injured by training a lot in the terrain. If I was to train that much, normal running, I would have just no way to be sustain it. And when I was a junior, there's no, I didn't train anything like that, but I did train quite intense. Probably trained, you know. I remember if I did a 45 minute run, that was that was like a long, really long run for me. But I rushed. Every, every round was as fast as I could. 
All right, that's about it for me. That's fantastic.